Psalm 103, and I'm going to read all of Psalm 103, and then we're going to spend a bit of time thinking about it together. This is a Davidic psalm. My soul, praise the Lord, and all that is within me, praise his holy name. My soul, praise the Lord, and do not forget all his benefits. He forgives all your sin. He heals all your diseases. He redeems your life from the pit. He crowns you with faithful love and compassion. He satisfies you with goodness. Your youth is renewed like the eagle. The Lord executes acts of righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He revealed his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and full of faithful love. He'll not always accuse us or be angry forever. He's not dealt with us as our sins deserve or repaid us according to our offences. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his faithful love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows what we are made of, remembering that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He blooms like a flower of the field, and when the wind passes over it, it vanishes, and its place is no longer known. But from eternity to eternity, the Lord's faithful love is toward those who fear him, and his righteousness toward the grandchildren of those who keep his covenant who remembered to observe his instruction. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, all his angels of great strength who do his word obedient to his command. Praise the Lord, all his armies, his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works in all the places where he rules. My soul, praise the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, every year on April 25, we remember, don't we? I remember my sister's birthday, but we all remember something else, don't we? We gather together as a nation, encouraged, reminded, exhorted at dawn and daylight ceremonies to remember and not to forget to remember the sacrifice of our armed personnel in fighting both at home and overseas to protect our freedoms as a nation. On Anzac Day, we gather to remember and not forget the benefits. To remember and not forget the benefits. Now, I know I sometimes grumble about having to get up so early for the West service on Anzac Day, but I appreciate it. I've benefited from their service immensely, as of all of us, haven't we? And I particularly appreciate the way all of the services use certain poems and odes every year. Uh, they've become familiar to many of us, haven't they? Uh, the Ode of Remembrance, They Shall Not Grow Old. Well, it's actually a combination of two poems, if you know your history. Uh, Lawrence Binion wrote a poem in 1914, For the Fallen. Uh, the fourth stanza of that poem, remembering the British service personnel who fell at the Battle of Mons, the fourth stanza is the bulk of the Ode of Remembrance. And then right at the end, we include an extra line, don't we? Lest we forget. Uh, that's taken from a poem by Rudyard Kipling called The Recessional written for the Diamond Jubilee of Queen Victoria in 1897. The combination of those two poems and those words is really quite moving, isn't it? Especially when you stand there in the dark and start to see those rays of sunlight. If you read Kipling's poem in full, and let me encourage you to do that, he actually reminds us of how temporary we are as human beings, doesn't he? It's a terrific reminder. Don't forget how temporary you are. 
how temporary the British Empire, shock, horror, really is when you compare it to the permanence and the magnificence of God. Every year when I leave those services, I'm always thinking about remembering. And for me in particular, I don't know about you, but for me in particular, I'm encouraged to think about how I remember God, his work and his rule. In fact, it's not just being reminded to remember, it's being confronted with my own forgetfulness. My own forgetfulness of the Lord and what he's done. Every year it seems to me I'm confronted by my tendency to whinge and not worship. To forget and not remember. And as I read Psalm 103 this week, that same confrontation happened. And we're going to spend some time in Psalm 103 this morning. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, Thanks for David, to whom this poem is attributed. Thank you for his conversation with his soul, for his exhortation to his own nature to praise you and not forget your benefits. Father, thank you that this was compiled into a book for the singing of your people as they gathered. Thank you that it is fulfilled in Jesus. Thank you that this is our psalm now. Father, please apply it to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as has been our want, the second point is always the same when we're looking at the psalms at the moment. We've got to get our bearings. This is our fourth psalm. Uh, Remember, they're poems or songs, as Ash reminded us. Uh, The composition of the psalms right across the time of the people of God from Moses through to the exile, the compilation... Well, that was probably around the end of the exile when God's people came back in the early 500s BC from being kicked out of the land under judgment and returned as a reminder of their God. They'd been removed because they wanted to be God instead of God. God had warned them and then God had done exactly as he said. And they returned, as you've remembered time after time over the last few weeks, they've returned diminished, they've been judged, They're demoralised, they're ruled now by Persia and these poems were brought together, compiled into a songbook about the good life that could only be found in God. In Psalm 1, the good life is described as having deep roots into the Lord's instruction, into his Torah. In Psalm 2, it's described as taking refuge in the Lord's King. In that introduction, the good life is found by having roots in the Lord's instruction and refuge in the Lord's King. And ultimately we learned as we looked at that introduction that we can sing it because Jesus is the Lord's instruction and the Lord's King. There's five books in the book of Psalms modelled on the five books of the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. It's the songbook that God's people compiled to sing together. And last week we saw how a, a, a person who has committed sin can have the good life. Remember David, Psalm 51? This week we're reminded not to forget the benefits of the one who gives us the good life and to sing his praises. Uh, It's a magnificent poem. I mean, which one in the book of Psalms isn't? But some just really touch you. Psalm 51's always uh, had an influence on me. Psalm 103, because at every funeral I read Psalm 103. It's one of those poems that sinks into you. It's been attributed to David. Do you notice it starts and ends with the same bookend, my soul, praise the Lord. It moves from the individual to the community to the globe. Uh, There's many ways of interpreting the structure, but this much is clear. The poem is about remembering and not forgetting so that you praise the Lord for all of his benefits. Uh, When I'm out running, and uh, it's a particularly tough run, and most of them are these days as I get older, I I try to repeat certain phrases to myself to encourage me. Uh, Sometimes it can be as simple as breakfast is coming. Sometimes it can be as this pain is worth it. But uh, sometimes we repeat certain phrases to ourselves time and time again to encourage ourselves to finish jobs. Uh, This poem begins with a repeated phrase. 
Uh, look there in verses 1 and 2. My soul, praise the Lord. And all that is within me, praise his holy name. My soul, praise the Lord. And do not forget all of his benefits. It's almost as if we've been given an insight into the poet's heart and mind, a window. And you notice that he exhorts himself. David exhorts himself to two actions that are so intertwined that you can't separate them. Praise the Lord. Don't forget all his benefits. Praise the Lord. Don't forget all of his benefits. And if you look at the poem itself and if you use the words of the poem, it boils down to this. Praise the name of the Lord and don't forget the nature of the Lord in action. Praise the name of the Lord and don't forget the nature of the Lord in action. And it's not, not distant, is it? Do you notice the word used there to describe God? We heard it in Exodus 34. The Lord, Yahweh, his personal, relational, covenant committing name. And he appeals to his own soul. It's a really personal moment, isn't it, in a poem? My soul, praise the Lord. And notice how all-encompassing it is here in verse 1. All that is within me, every fibre of my being, praise the Lord and don't forget. It's really an exhortation to just say how great God is, to share his name, to point out his nature, to show that as he's revealed in what he says and does, he is the most magnificent thing, being, whatever you want to call him, the most magnificent person in all of the universe. And I want to bend every fibre of my being to making sure people know that. And at the heart of that praise is not forgetting. Did you notice that there in verse 2? The two verses stand together. My soul, praise the Lord. All that's within me, praise his name. My soul, praise the Lord and don't forget all of his benefits, how he expresses his nature. Remembering is not something we do well, is it? Really. Uh, If you look at history, uh, intellectual history, humans have a very fraught relationship with remembering. Uh, On the one hand, we want to be remembered, don't we? All of us want to be remembered. Uh, On the other hand, at at the time we're living now, all of society tells us to live in the now. You can't really want to be remembered and only live in the present, can you? The two are contradictory. To live in the now is a profoundly forgetful attitude. It's short-sighted. It's limited. It's impetuous. Uh, I think it's captured in social media. Social media is a medium that says... Express what you're feeling now and blurt it out. The problem is we then forget that it's digitally there forever, don't we? How can you live in the now and then have something that's remembered forever? It's contradictory. To remember, to remember rightly, is to have the right balance between here and the hereafter. It's to have the right balance between the present and the past. To remember is to have today in its right context, the context of who I am and how I have gotten here. To remember is not to live in the now, but it's to live rightly now because of then, what has happened. And that's what the psalmist wants us to do to remember rightly. Now, you've got to remember, as God's people gather, remember, as they've come back from exile, they're singing this psalm. They're gathered together and they're being reminded, remember all of his benefits. Praise God. And they're standing there fearful, diminished, in a temple that's tiny, with Persia ruling over them at a moment where they are prone to self-pity and whinging, forgetfulness, they're being reminded to praise the Lord and not forget his benefits. They're being pointed to God's name and his nature. And you can almost hear them saying, well, tell me all those benefits. 
And so David takes the opportunity, doesn't he? Look there in verse 3. He forgives all your sin. He heals all your diseases. He redeems your life from the pit. He crowns you with faithful love and compassion. He satisfies you with goodness. Your youth is renewed like the eagle. It's almost like David's having a conversation with his own soul and put it down on paper so God's people can have that conversation. Remember all of his benefits. And let me tell you, that list of benefits is more impressive than any earthly bank account or insurance policy, isn't it? Better than any medical fund. It's all-encompassing from brokenness to goodness. It's all-encompassing because it deals with body and soul. It's all-encompassing because it deals with life and death. And as God deals, as the Lord deals with the decay, he also brings the goodness, the satisfaction, the energy that is needed for life as one of God's people. And when you go through that list of benefits, they're astounding, aren't they? It starts at the core with your desire to be God instead of God. And what does God do with that? Did you notice it there in verse 3? He forgives it. We saw what that looked like last week in Psalm 51, didn't we? I mean, imagine forgiving a man like that. And the benefits then move to your physical existence your daily needs and your physical needs. And then it moves to the needs at the end of life. He will save your life from the pit. The grave is not the end. And then it moves to providing all the good stuff as well. Do you notice that? In verse 5, God doesn't just deal with the decay, but he brings the good stuff. The Lord does all of that for you. Did you notice that? He forgives all your, heals all your, redeems your, crowns you, satisfies you, so your youth. Can you imagine standing there as God's people in that really tin pot temple? You've just come back from exile. You've just returned from judgment. You're standing there surrounded by the temple rebuilt. Oh, it's not as big as it used to be, but you can have sacrifices now. And you return to the home in your own home and you're there with your own mob. You're surrounded by the benefits. <laughs> there in your own land. What an antidote to self-pity and self-loathing and regret and guilt. Look at the benefits. And it's rooted in history. I'm at point five on the outline. Look there in verse 6, the Lord executes acts of righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He revealed his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, full of faithful love. He'll not always accuse us or be angry forever. He's not dealt with us as our sins deserve or repaid us according to our offences. The key here is verse 8. The key here is verse 8 because verse 8 is a trigger verse. Look there at verse 8. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and full of faithful love. It's almost as if, like Carly did in that kid's talk, they've opened up a theological dictionary and gone, the benefits of God are summarised in his name. The benefits of God are summarised in his name. We're so unfamiliar with our Bibles that we don't realise how important verse 8 is as a quotation from the Old Testament. Exodus 34, verse 6, if you've got your Bibles, let me encourage you, always have your Bibles open when someone's preaching. Always got to check what they say against the Bible. So turn with me to Exodus 34. Turn with me to Exodus 34. Remember we read this earlier? This was when uh, God gave Moses two new stone tablets. And the verse 5, the Lord came down in a cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, Yahweh. Then the Lord, that's Yahweh, passed in front of Moses and proclaimed, Yahweh, Yahweh is compassion, is a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, rich in faithful love and truth. Psalm 103 quotes Exodus 34 verse 6 when God speaks his own name and gives it the definition. And if you've got your Bibles open there in Exodus 34, you'll realise where it happens. It's directly after a great incident of forgetfulness, isn't it? 
You see, Moses has been on Mount Sinai dealing with the Lord for his people. He's receiving things like the Ten Commandments and communicating with the Lord on behalf of the Lord's people and on behalf of the Lord to the people. And as Moses descends there at the end of Exodus 31, what have the people been busy doing? They've been busy forgetting. Now look at Exodus 32, verse 1. When the people saw that Moses delayed in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, make us a God who will go before us, because this Moses, the man who brought us from the land of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him. We've forgotten him. How quickly they've forgotten. <laughs> they've just been saved from slavery. They've just seen the plagues. They've had the sea opened up in front of them. They've received the Ten Commandments. They've had Moses bravely walk in front of them, led by the Lord, and now they forget. What a forgetful people. It's often the case with God's people, isn't it? Forgetful. <laughs> Think about Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden as they listen to the snake. <laughs> Can you imagine forgetting in the Garden of Eden? <laughs> how good God is. Remember Abraham on countless occasions. Remember Isaac as he tries to give the blessing to the elder over the younger. Remember David and Bathsheba. They're a forgetful people, the people of God. They forget even whose image they bear as they look in the mirror every morning. And the Lord, committed in faithful love to his mob, is well within his rights to wipe them out there in Exodus, isn't he? And that's what he says. Moses pleads on behalf of the people. And when you read that account in Exodus, you'll find that he pleads on the basis of the name and the nature of God. Exactly the same name and nature described in Psalm 103. And what does the Lord do? Well, he lives up to his name and his nature and he relents. He doesn't wipe them out. He doesn't deal with them as they deserve. He saved them from slavery. He's committed to them in love. He's provided for them in compassion. And now he treats them with grace, giving them what they do not deserve. That's the name of the Lord. That's the work of his nature. The one who is faithfully committed in love to a people who rebel against him. That was his name and nature then. That was his name and nature when David wrote the poem. That's his name and nature as God's people return. And to forget that name and nature in history is to turn to sin, isn't it? It's to turn to sin. Just look at the pages of history. How is it possible for God to be like that? Well, so that we can capture some of what that's like, we're then given a number of images. Uh, I'm in, in verses 11 to 14. I'm at point six on the outline. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his faithful love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows what we're made of, Remembering that we are dust. Aren't they good images? I wish I was good with images. But they're magnificent, aren't they? As high as that sky is above the earth, that's how big God's love is. As far as east is from the west, that's how far God's removed your sin. Think of the greatest compassion a father has on his children and the Lord's is greater. And why do we need that? Well, look at what we're like. What are, what are we like there in verse 14? We're dusty. We're temporary. But do you notice that those images are all applied specifically? Did you notice that? They're applied to the people who fear the Lord, to his own mob. And another description of fearing the Lord is down in verse 18. Of those who remember to observe his instructions. There's that remembering. 
This isn't like God's general grace and provision where he just sends rain on whoever he decides and makes sure the sun comes up. This is God's committed love to his people, his mob, his household, to those who remember his benefits. Can can you imagine saying this as you're gathered as a people returned from exile? God's forgotten us. No, he hasn't. You might have forgotten him. He has not forgotten you. The only reason you stand in that temple forecourt is because of how big God's love is, how far he's removed your sin, how compassionate he is, because left to your own devices, you're dust. Isn't that good? What benefits? And it's brought home in verses 15 to 19 as we get that comparison. As for man, his days are like grass. He blooms like a flower of the field. When the wind passes over it, it vanishes. Its place is no longer known. But from eternity to eternity. Notice it's not from east to west. (laughs) But from eternity to eternity. The Lord's faithful love is towards those who fear him and his righteousness towards the grandchildren of those who keep his covenant, who remember to observe his instruction. The Lord has established his throne in heaven. His kingdom rules over all. I don't think it's a mistake that I read those verses in every Anglican burial service. And I read them just before the prayer of committal when we lower the coffin because that's the moment the contrast stands out greatest, isn't it? We're going back to the dust and God exists for eternity to eternity. It's exactly what Rudyard Kipling was saying in the recessional. How is the British Empire described? The empire upon which the sun never set. That's as far as east is from west, isn't it, really? Well, that is dusty compared to eternity to eternity. And remember it when your box is lowered, lest we forget. The Lord is so committed in faithful love, so committed to his people, so committed to those who remember even though they rebel, that there is a permanent marker for all time. His king is enthroned above everything. Remember Psalm 2? That's what that verse there in verse 19 is describing. There's the evidence. We are dusty, but God is permanent. And the final outcome I'm at point eight on the outline, the last three verses. Praise the Lord. If you've remembered all these benefits, who's to praise the Lord? All of his angels. Verse 21, praise the Lord. Who's to praise the Lord? All those who do his will. Verse 22, praise the Lord. Who's to praise the Lord? All of his works in all the places where he rules. My soul, praise the Lord. At the heart of sin is forgetfulness. I'm at the last point on the outline. The first attribute of sin is to forget who God is. That's a pattern right throughout the Bible. It forgets the Lord's committed and faithful love. It forgets his continuous provision of all that his people need. It forgets his perseverance with a rebellious creation. And as it forgets, it then aspires to be Lord instead, doesn't it? Even as God's people return from the judgment for their sin, from the exile, what do they soon do? They forget again, don't they? And they're prone to sinking back into wanting to be God instead of God. Don't think that God's silence between the Testaments is his forgetting, because he doesn't. That's why the opening for Matthew's gospel is so wonderful. Remember that back in the dim, dark, distant past in 2019? Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. This is the account of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. God doesn't forget. And God expresses his faithful love to his broken world by Jesus coming, as God promised, to deal with our sin. Remember Psalm 51? And so Jesus himself is the name and nature of God. Verse 8, 
dealing with our sins as we don't deserve. Can you imagine someone going, I I can live life for you, so I will then die for you, and I will rise to show that all that I have done is sufficient for your sins to be forgiven, though you don't deserve it. So we can join with the psalmist, can't we? In those same repeated phrases, praise the Lord. Don't forget his benefits. So let me close with these three thoughts about application. First, please remember, don't forget his benefits as individuals, as households, as children. The model of Anzac Day is a great model, isn't it? Do you notice that there's nothing different about any Anzac Day service every year? It's the same. We keep doing it and we remember. It's the same with remembering the benefits of the Lord. It's as simple as dealing with the same words again and again, isn't it? Opening the Bible and reading it. If you read the Bible, you will always meet all his benefits and you won't forget them. Second, Please let that lead you to praise, pointing out how magnificent God is. And we were given a number of different options there in the kids' talk, weren't we? Song, action, prayer, community, statement, words. Pepper your conversation with it. Use your conversation with whoever you are with, even in little words. Are you going on long service leave? God willing, we will. Because that's a benefit. Be wholeheartedly committed to him. Encourage each other in that. Let let me just go on a slight tangent. I read a terrific book this way. It's a kid's book. It's based on a Yiddish moral tale. Uh, It could always be worse. And the problem with that attitude is that it's always relative praise, isn't it? Not absolute praise. Do you know there's nothing relative about Psalm 103? Deal with God because he's slightly better than the other alternative? It's just absolute. Praise God. <laughs> Look at all he's done. Let me encourage you to praise God absolutely. Not relatively, but absolutely. And thirdly, as we remember, as we praise, please proclaim. Point out to others how great God is and the benefits that come from him. Let me pray. Father, thank you for Psalm 103. There's a lot in there, uh, Father, but at its heart uh, is your name and nature. Please help us not to forget. And, Father, as we don't forget, please help us to praise you for all of your benefits, for all of your nature. In Jesus' name, amen. Any questions? Mr. Stiller. (laughs) Have you been talking to Ros Tobin during the week? (laughs) Uh, Yeah, some of our older older translations use the word um, blessed, don't they? Uh, And uh, it was interesting with the Hebrew words that came up that Ash and Carly pointed out, the word barak is the Hebrew word there. Uh, like every word translated, and Warwick's question is, what's the difference between bless and praise, depending on your translation? Like every word translated, there's what's called a semantic range. You can take a number of options. Uh, in this instance, the word barak can be translated, I think, better, and I think that's why the idea of praise is helpful, is look at the one who brings all the blessings, which is a notion of praise rather than God, we give you a thumbs up, which is the notion of blessing. Okay, So I think it picks up the idea that I want you to look at God so that you can see all that he provides. So it's, it's at least approval, which is what blessing is, but it's more than that. It's looking at the one who brings approval. So there's a big range, and I think the word praise is a more helpful one at this point. Does that answer your question? Terrific. Any other questions? Yep, up the back. Uh, this is from Ebony. Ideas on how to praise God through dark times. 
Yeah, e Ebony, thanks for the question. Wave to Ebony at home, everyone. Uh, that's our first question on text message at church. There you go. Uh, how to praise God in dark times. Uh, Ebony, it's a good question, and I think it's a situation that everyone sitting in church today has experienced at some point. And so I think the first port of call is, in dark times, what are we immediately prone to do? To forget, aren't we? Remember God's people, they've just come back, diminished, ruled by Persia, everything is not as good. So the reminder to remember all his benefits is the first port of call. Remember the benefits. The best place to start praising God in dark times is by reading of God, about God, the revelation of God. I think the second one is turn those words into prayers. That's why the Psalms are so good. Uh, in Psalm 103, verses 1 and 2, you've got a ready-made prayer that you can say every day of the week. Uh, Psalm 51, verses 8 to 10, uh, Lord, renew in me a steadfast spirit because I'm prone to forgetfulness. So I think that's the second thing. And I think the third thing is there is no mistake that the individual Psalms were compiled into a community songbook. There's goodness in community, isn't it? In being part of a mob, a household. And so one of the key ways to praise God in dark times is to spend time with the household of God in dark times. And so I reckon they're the three baselines. That might look like different things. It might mean that you do that through singing. Uh, it might mean that you do that through meeting together around meals. Uh, it might do that, you might do that through text messages, induct, please pray for me, X. But those three are the baseline. Remember the benefits, turn the words of the benefits into prayer and do it as a community.